What's up, everybody? Welcome to Dane's Platform for another episode. And today we're going to dive deep into the topic of offensive and defensive linemen play, the technicality behind it, the physicality behind it, and who better to have on this podcast than 11-year NFL vet and NFL uh, analyst and creator of Baldy's Breakdown, Brian Baldinger. Thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Dane. I mean, I'm I'm in my element here, Dane. I got to tell you, I mean, I'm I'm on the third floor at NFL Films here. I got my office. I, I practice social distancing every day. There's nobody on the third floor. <laughs> I'm the only one up here, except for two guys in the IT department, which basically bail me out every time <laughs> technology beats me. So okay. I got, I mean, I've got my team here, and uh, I, I'm right in my element here, talking line play and training and all the stuff that you're into right now, Dave. Well, and, and that's where I want to go right away. Is like one of the things that that sort of took me to, you know, I'm, I'm training wrestlers, I'm training throwers, all these other athletes. But one of the big things for me is that, you know, I stumbled upon you like, I don't know, two years ago or something on Instagram. And the way you break down line play, I feel like everybody should be breaking it down that way. And what you put out for a normal person like me, who, who is, you know, I, I'm, I played football and stuff, but I was, I was, I was decent, but never at your level where you played yeah. the NFL and you make it so simple. So I, I've got to thank you for, for putting out such good content. Thanks. Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I kind of started it maybe around three years ago, the Baldy's breakdowns because I, I, I'm an NFL analyst at heart. I mean, I, I did games at Fox on Sundays for 12 years. I did college football for nine years for them. And I listen to games all the time. I love football. And I just felt like, even, you know, nothing against any analyst that's out, out there. I mean, they all do their work. But the game moves so fast, and we sort of talk about quarterbacks a lot, and we talk about wide receivers, but we really don't talk about the trenches. And you really don't have time. I mean, I, I've been guilty of it. You don't have time during an NFL game to really go into details right. about why a player wins, doesn't win, why a team, you know, wins that down, loses that down. And there's just so many, so many intricacies. The only way you can learn it is to slow it down and, and break it down and study it. And I just felt there was a big missing ingredient, right? you know, right. in the analysis. I, I, the fans, you know, look, they, they read their PFF. They study their stats. I mean, you can't make – you can't BS these fans. I mean, they're into it. But you, ha you can give them more. You could teach them because there's a lot of – I always talk, talk about, like, the toolbox. Every player has yeah. – if they want to be successful – um, you, you mentioned, you know, and just getting to know you that you, you played against Joe Thomas and with Joe Thomas at some level. And, you know, I mean, Joe Thomas was the ultimate technician, but every player, whether it's Joe Thomas or whether it's Patrick Mahomes or pick a player, Travis Kelsey, I mean, they all have a toolbox that they've got to perfect in order to be good every week, to be great every week. And if you don't, you'll be inconsistent. You'll be up and down. You'll, you probably won't have a long career. And so I basically have studied the toolboxes of every single position. And I kind of know whether you're a cornerback, inside linebacker, uh, an offensive tackle, the things that you have to be able to, ma to, to really uh, perfect if you want to be an all-pro player or just get – like me, I wasn't an all-pro player, but I had a long, sustained career yeah. because I perfected a number of different fundamentals that you got to have if you're going up against, you know, back in my day, if you're going up against Bruce Smith or Reggie White or Randy White, you know, the best to play the positions. If you wanted to have a chance against those players, you had to have a really good toolbox. Well, and that sort of brings me to my, my first question was, could you give us, you know, you analyze all these linemen, you know, let's say defense, offensive linemen, that those like three or four key elements that you've sort of seen you know, I don't, strength, speed, whatever it is that all of these guys and Aaron Donald and Joe Thomas, what, what is it on each side of the ball that those that's consistent among the best? Well, it always, it always starts with effort. I mean, effort, you, you, you can't coach effort, um, you know, but it's the equalizer. It's why a lot of, you know, Jason Taylor was a fourth round pick out of Akron. Yep. He went all the way to the hall of fame. I mean, somebody said, you know, he wasn't talented enough coming out of Akron, small school, too skinny, all that stuff. You know, he had 140-something sacks. I mean, but his effort was every play, you know, at, at every game. I mean, it was noticeable. And so the first thing I see within the line play, especially defensive lineman, is effort. Aaron Donald's effort. 
is is unmatched. But then if you take just stay with Aaron Donald, uh, pad level, you know, he's six foot tall to begin with. That was his not coming out of Pittsburgh was he's going to be too small at six foot, 290 pounds to play in the NFL. Well, he's six foot, 290, maybe 300 pounds, but he is the single most explosive player in the league. So when you watch him in a very short space explode into 340 pound offensive lineman, like he knocks the wind right out of him. So with his power step, you know, his first step, first of all, he's a very compact player, but he understands, um, if, you, if you get into physics, he understands vectors. You know, so a force going in one direction is a lot more sustainable than if you try to change direction or you go at an angle. His force is always going right through you. So he's square going north-south, and then when he flattens, he flattens square. So he can turn his hips. He can he, – he, he can flip his hips. He can turn his hips right. to get the best angle into the, the 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 offensive lineman. All right, and so he does that with low pad level, and then he has there's probably six or eight pass rush moves in totality. Right. I mean, there's the rip, there's the rip club, there's the spin, there's the speed to power. You know, there's a straight bull rush. There's basically six or eight moves. And he has all he, – he can do all eight. Okay, let's just say there's a max of eight. He can do all eight. But then he can – as soon as you take the first one away, he knows how to transition to the second one, mm -hmm. into the third one. And so in any given play, there's the cross chop. I don't want to leave out the cross chop. It's the newest dance move in the NFL. <laughs> but, you know, he can cross chop um, where he's knocking down the opposite offensive lineman's hands as he's jumping in through the gap. So he's gaining distance as he's chopping the hands down, which forces linemen to kind of duck their heads and go forward. So, and none of it is premeditated, okay? So it's all based on what you're doing or by what the scheme is. So if he's lining up, let's say, on the offensive guard, okay, and the center slides away, he's got a big gap inside there that he can go inside on a pass rush. So now, as soon as he sees that, He's like, okay, I can swim inside. I can rip inside. I can take advantage of that big wide gorge yeah, yeah. inside. It's not premeditated. It's all based on what the scheme is against him and who he's going up against. And if you take that inside move away, he might immediately swim outside of you and then throw a rip on you. And so it's always a succession of moves. And so he has the counter to the counter to the counter. And nobody has that many or that ability to do all that. Now, how does he do it? Well, he watches a lot of film. So he, he understands your tendencies. Okay. And I'm just saying, Aaron, but you could go, you know, the, the best players, you know, Miles Garrett, yeah, yeah. you know, at Cleveland is the single best defensive end in the league right now. Right. Um, so you're taking elite talent and you put that with great film study, like um, Miles Garrett's been working with Bruce Smith for the last couple of years. Bruce Smith is the all-time sack leader in the NFL with 200 sacks. He could do things that no player in the history of the game could do. He could bend at an angle that nobody else could bend at. You know, at a 45 degree angle, he could sustain his moves without face planting, without falling down, without his feet coming out from underneath him. So I'm just, so it, it starts with talent, then um, studying the opponent, a lot of film study, tendencies, Okay, what, what are they, what are they, what's their way to take my move away? How can I beat that? And so you spend a lot of time in the film room. You spend a lot of time studying the tendencies. And then you start putting your game plan together. And then guys like Joe Thomas, yeah, uh, we'll come back to, you know, Joe Thomas, is he kept a book on every single player that he played against. So if he went up against uh, Terrell Suggs in Baltimore, always great matchups, Cleveland, Baltimore, those players, um, he had a book on what T. Sizzle, Terrell Subs did. So he knew his best moves. He knew his third down moves. When they had to get a play in the fourth quarter, what that move was going to be. All right, so I got to prepare myself for that. You know, and then they all put their own individuality on it. Joe Thomas, uh, you, you go to an offensive line coach, say Bob Wiley, who coached Joe in Cleveland. 
you know, Bob was big on getting hands inside. We always say in the trenches, the hand inside, they win because they can control the body. But some of these guys, like Joe, are so big and so wide that they can't get physically get their hands inside. You can't narrow your wide shoulders to get them inside. So what Joe found was, I'm going to get one hand inside, but the other hand is going to hit the opposition's bicep. And if you blindfolded Joe Thomas over 10 years, and he played over 10,000 straight plays in a row, right? And you blindfolded Joe in his pass rush move, he could literally hit inside bicep, inside bicep, consistently. I mean, so then it becomes a consistent thing. You know, how consistent can you be at hitting your marks? And that's all, that's all reps over and over. I watched the video where you, you talked with Joe about even Jason Taylor, where he's like, I knew he was coming in with that long hand and I'm, I'm looking for it. And I guess that, that sort of sparked my next thought is like, okay, yeah. so if these guys all have they they've got to be super mobile so they can bend like Miles Garrett, like Bruce Smith did, um, you know, like Aaron Donald does even Joe, you know, Joe's six, six, but he yeah. has had levels. Low. He had a fight to stay down. Stay yeah, low. So, so it's like, they're stupid strong. They're really mobile. They're really explosive. They understand tendencies and, 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 and the art of what these they're guys smart. are smart. But what is it like when you're around these guys and you see them, it's like by the second step, you know, Akeem Hicks, by a second step, he knows where he's going with, with his hands. It's like, is it, is it that so many reps they can almost slow the game down? Is it just feel and it and and they're so good in that like flow movement or what is it yeah. specifically? Or is yeah, it no, it's a, it, 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 it's 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 really good question, Dane. Uh, it does the reps are huge, okay? Like the, you know, they always say that you know repetition is the mother of invention, yeah. right? I mean, it, it, it's a cliche for a reason. It's true. <laughs> yeah. and so, like, I think a lot of guys this year because of the pandemic and really no on the field work. You, you see, you don't see quite see the leap that a lot of first year players normally make between first and second year. They didn't get that year on the field. And so you, you don't see quite the jump that a lot of guys normally make. That's usually the biggest jump between your first and second year. But the repetition is huge where you just rep it over and over. I remember when I was, um, when I was playing with the Dallas Cowboys, we always scrimmage um, the Raiders at that time. We, in training camp, we, we, we were trained in Thousand Oaks, California. The Raiders were in Oxnard, California. And we always scrimmaged at some point during the preseason. And so if you look at Howie Long, for example, like Howie Long had a weird body. I mean, he was six foot five, but he had short legs. Yeah, yeah. He had a low yeah. center of gravity. He had a tall torso, but he had a short level uh, lower gravity. So he, he was very strong from the waist down. He had good lower center of gravity, good base. But, like, I would watch him, you know, just in their individual warm-ups. And, like, literally, he had a great defensive line coach there in Oakland. And they, he coached a lot of great players there. But they would literally – their signature move was the rip. And they would practice the rip against, you know, a guy opposite him. Like, just throw the rip with the right hand. Throw the lip with, rip with the left hand. Pull the rip out and club. Rip, club, rip. You know, uh, swat, rip. Like, they literally went through this stuff like just in their warm-up individual drills every day to the point where they could throw that rip against anybody, right. you know? And then you, you, you'd go, okay, th well, this is how, um, you know, this all-pro guard is stopping the rip, okay? Well, what's the counter to it? Well, let's throw the rip and then let's bring the club out. We'll get them leaning, then we'll club them, then we'll beat them. And so it was uh, – a. I, I watched how we do that, and it was no wonder they were so good at it. They they worked on that every single day. Right, right. Um, if you go on the other side to say the Buffalo Bills, who went to four straight Super Bowls in a row from ninety to ninety three, if you watched, their, I, I was up there for a training camp. My brother, one of my brothers, played in Buffalo. Like they literally in their individual drills and in their offense, they literally worked four running plays against every imaginable scheme there was, and every single rep they did in walkthroughs was those four running plays where they perfected those running plays. One of the reasons why Thurman Thomas and the offense was almost unstoppable. No matter what your, um, your changeup was to their inside zone, their outside zone, their counter play, they knew how to block it. They knew how to, because of all the reps they had against it. 
as a, as a team. So we're talking about individual players, and then we're taking a group like the Buffalo Bills in their K-Gun offense, which was really simple. But it was so effective because even if you knew it was coming, they perfected all these plays against every look that you could do against it. Because, because of the, the reps and oh, just the same thing over and over again. I guess yeah. that leaves me, you know, what you had said there a little bit about uh, that, that jump in 2020 like, that you're seeing like sort of lacked. Is, is, that, is that the res- what's, you know, we're seeing all these injuries this year in, a, in 2020 that are just like, like catastrophic injuries. Yeah. And is it, is it a, a factor of the reps these guys are missing because, they're, because of the pandemic? Is it the, the fact that, you know, maybe they're, the way they're training, is it the, their, their approach? They're not taking the cerebral approach that Miles Garrett, that Joe Thomas, that Bruce Smith, these guys take or have taken in the past. What is it exactly then regarding those injuries? Well, that, is it the reps or, or is it their training or both, you know? So if you look at, um, I believe it was week two or three this year, Saquon Barkley and Nick Boza both went out with ACL tears. Okay? Yep. And we're talking about guys that have been playing this game their entire life. They've never had an ACL injury, ever. They get hurt on the same day, early in the season. So this is a contact sport, Dane, and you need contact to basically build calluses. And, and with no contact this year, not just no training camp, no preseason games, right. no contact, but no field work throughout the months of April, May, June, and July, many camps on the field work, like no work to just do football moves. And that, that leads me to this is the only way to get better at right guard is to play right guard. And so what substituted this year, um, all of the normal work was, okay, we'll, we'll just train harder. We'll do explosive moves. We'll, we'll do more clean and jerks. We'll do all this stuff. And the weight room is the weight room. And there's a place for that. But nothing sub- is a substitute for playing the game. For what you're doing on the field. What you do on the field. Yeah. And so field work, like we used to do duck walks, Dean, right? Yeah. I hate duck walks. You know, that's where you're in that squat position. Yeah. And you're just taking a step and a step, but it's keeping you low. It's, it's forcing you to learn to move in a low stance without standing up. Okay? And, and I can still feel the pain in my legs and the burn. <laughs> in my thighs, right, from doing duck walks. Now, you know, at my age right now, duck walks isn't a good thing. <laughs> the knees are taking a beating. But, but I, you know, doing football moves, they, nobody did that this year for months. You know, for a guy like, say, Nick Boza, he didn't play any football, and, and he was amongst the best immediately, the way they played the game, the way he tacked, how hard he played, his strength, point of attack. I mean, he was just a phenomenal player. But – you know, think about it. He played the Super Bowl game, and he was really good in the Super Bowl on February 2nd. And yeah. then he didn't play a down of football until the 49ers opened up against the Arizona Cardinals on September 10th. Like, you can't go eight months without playing football and think that you can just go play football again. Right. And there was a, a little ramp-up period, you know, from July 27th. But really, they didn't play any football. They didn't, nobody hit anybody. And I think it's a huge contributor right now to just the massive number of injuries that these teams are seeing. Well, we have, we have a kid right now who, who got released by the Texans, a, a middle linebacker. He's a starting linebacker from Penn State for two years. So he was down there for eight weeks, and he's like, dude, we didn't hit the entire time we're there. We were barely even doing anything in the weight room. And then thinking about what you just said, it goes, you know, that'd be like a wrestler or a shot putter. Lifting weights is great. Doing the jumps and being explosive yeah. is great. But if you're not going to take reps in the circle, you're not going to get reps on the mat. You, you're not going to have – it's a skilled sport. You know, the way you described Aaron Donald and his approach or, you know, think about Joe Thomas. It's like this is a skill that these guys have to hone in on. And if yeah. they don't have that skill refined, they're going to get banged up. Yeah. Dane, look, I mean, I've been being facetious here. But you can't learn a, a, a two-legged takedown on Zoom. You can't do it. <laughs> Like, you have to get in the mat, and right. you got to rep that move yep. against, you know, you, you, I mean, you might go, if you're a 190-pound, you know, light heavyweight wrestler, you might rep that move against 130-pound super quick guys just to work on the quickness. 
you might rep it against a 250 pound super heavyweight just to work it against a bigger guy. Right. You know, and it's the same thing. Like Nick Bosa's abilities, like he can be any offensive tackle in this league, any scheme, chip blocks. But if you're not working on those things, slide blocks, double teams, like if you're not physically going against those guys, like at a, at a, a real at a high speed, at a high speed level, I mean, you can't always recreate game speed. But I mean, I know a lot of coaches in this league that even in today's world where they've really kind of, you know, put the, you know, keep the gloves on, they'll still go like live contact every day, uh, five days in a row, just to build some toughness and get your body used to being hit. Um, right. Matt Rule, who we saw last, you know, last night, who I've known since his days at Temple and Baylor and now the head coach of the Carolina Panthers, he still has a live, um, a live practice every Wednesday. Okay. He starts every practice um, with live tackling drills for everybody. Quarterbacks, everybody has to learn how to tackle. Does ta- your quarterbacks throw interceptions? Learn how to tackle. Yeah, tackle. Yeah. Um, so he still does it, and they they have as now I don't know this. You know, I don't have all these stats in front of me, but he's had a low number of serious injuries at Carolina this year. Yeah, and I know compared to everybody reason, else. And compared to everybody else, and I went. I have, I actually went down there on my own this year to training camp just to watch and see if he was going to do the same approach that he did at Temple and at Baylor. And he did. I mean, they, they hit a lot. Now they lost some players. I mean, Christian McCaffrey will come back, but they didn't lose it for the season. Right. But they have a low number compared to a lot of teams that have lost a lot of players. And it's a huge factor. um, The coronavirus, the pandemic world and what players weren't able to do this year. Well, so take us then, you know, talking about banging up, getting injured, I want to go into – you talk about Joe Thomas and, 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 it's, and you know, a guy played 10,000 snaps and, and probably is the best – one of the best linemen ever possibly and then, you know, definitely over the last decade. And, and you look at that longevity and the skill he had. And it's like, I guess go in – if you can, go into some, some detail where it's like, you know, the, the hand placement on the bicep and the chest plate and then how um, – you know, he changed the game and that skill, but also what's the difference? One of the big questions I wanted to know was what's the difference between a Joe Thomas and how he, he's going to have his hand placement versus an interior lineman, like a guard, who's going to be playing, you know, playing against D tackles. What's, what are the variables or the skill differences? But first, I guess, you know, go in, go into the, the, the Joe Thomas yeah. technique. Well, I mean, if you just take Joe, I mean, Joe was the first round pick out of Wisconsin. He was, you know, high pick, I don't know, third pick in the draft or whatever. I mean, he, he was a he was a really good college football player. Um, and everybody's looking for a left tackle that can protect the blind side of quarterbacks. So, all right, so he, he, he comes in with, you know, um, a lot of, you know, and he's got the requisite size. He's six foot six. He's got long arms. He's a, he's a good athlete. He's not a great athlete. He's, uh, I wouldn't say that he was. You know, he wasn't running four eight forties and, you know, dunking basketballs the way some guys could do, but he was a good athlete. But what he did was he turned playing left tackle into a science. Okay. And so to him, like his, his, uh, pass set, he thought the most important thing was to get off the ball and get to a spot as quickly as he possibly could and then get ready for whatever the defensive end outside linebacker was going to do to him. All right. Was he going to try to run around him, run through him, get off inside? Were they going to try to run a stunt? Like, but his big thing was to get back and get ready. And within that second, that, that whole thing takes place. How can I do that the quickest that I could? So he was a shot putter and discus player, um, you know, athlete in, in high school. Yeah. And so when he learned, was the kick step in the shot put. So you coach, you know, field athletes that are shot putters and discus putters. Yeah. So you, you're looking for really explosive athletes in a very small circle, right? So yeah. he, he took that concept and the shot putters got that, you know, that 16 pound ball right there. And, and then their first step is straight back. And then they're trying to get as much speed in a short period in order to launch that ball, right? So Joe took that same mentality 
as that offense tackle. And so his first step was vertical, back, like he was shot putting, to get back as quickly as he could, and then to get set to see what's going to happen. So th- that was the first thing. Then it was put all of the weight. He had an unusual stance. He, and in fact, you, you, you could line up 100 offensive tackles for me, take the name and the jerseys off them, just put them, just give me the silhouette of them. Yeah. And I'll pick out Joe Thomas because <laughs> he was hunched over. He was hunched over his he right shoulder side leg. Huh? He'd do that thing with his shoulder to keep his yeah, I don't shoulder. even know if I could do this on Zoom, but he was like this down low like this. <laughs> I, 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 it's too tight. But, um, but he was hunched down over that right leg, and all of his weight was on the inside right leg. And then from that, everything he did in the next move when the ball snapped, was to explode as quickly as he could straight back. And to him, it was all the weight, as much weight possible on that inside right foot. And then that left, the left leg was as light as possibly could be to right. get as much distance and depth as he could. Okay. And, and then the thing is when, and then when the, the, the end or the linebacker would approach, like when he set, Like he wanted from the feet through the knees to the hips to all be in alignment. All right. To have the most amount of ability to shock and to absorb. If you if your ankles are going, feet are going one way and your knees the other, you're never going to have the balance necessary to be able to deliver a blow and absorb uh, the shock. And so to him, that's the physics part of it. Like he literally was looking at his, where his feet were, the knees and the hips all going in the, all aligned in the same alignment, all congruently aligned. When you describe that too, because I, I mean, knowing the glide, it, it, it also, I also, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is, this is one question I had because of a lot of guys I'm going to be working with are going to be more high school collegiate level. Yeah. So they might run the ball a little bit more, but with, with Joe having that load on his front foot, it's like it puts him in this situation where he can drive back as well, but it also puts him in a good position where if they're run blocking, he's got so much weight moving forward, his stance is almost mimicking like a D end or a D yeah. tackle. Yeah, so, no, no, it was a perfect – it was the perfect um, – what you want – well, first of all, you're looking for a consistent stance where nobody can read you yeah. and go, oh, he's run blocking. Because these guys are really smart on the other side of the ball. So if there's any – they're always – studying to look for any tendency. Uh, well, he, he's in a run blocking stance right now. You hear that a lot. But if you have the exact same stance every single play, he's not giving it away. But at the same time, if you had a step inside, okay, like the one thing about Joe was because he was low to begin with, he was already at six foot six. On any, you pick out any play, any run play. Like his aiming point in the run game was always the hip, you know, like saying on a combo block. Yeah, yeah. If you hit the hip, that if you hit the hip, you're already going to be the lowest guy right. on the field. So even if you're six foot six, if you hit the hip, that's your aiming point, you, you're going to force yourself to stay low. All so right. Because why, the worst why thing more, you can, why don't more guys now do that then? Why don't why don't they sort of copy what Joe did because of that? Because of how low he would be with the run play, but also how quickly he can get back. And cover that ground so he's prepared for that set for that you know set that contact. Because you know because like some guys just don't you know their mindset isn't to be the best. It's yeah. Just yeah, yeah. You know, it's unfortunate. I mean, if I was like, why why wouldn't every offensive tackle or offensive lineman in Cleveland that he played? He played with a lot of good players. Yeah. I mean, Alex Mack was there. I mean, he had some you know like Cleveland they just couldn't keep them. They, these you know, but there was a lot of great players. Kevin Zeitler was there. Mitchell Schwartz was there. I mean, yeah, they had all pros at some point altogether and they couldn't figure it all out. But, you know, why wouldn't you want to try to emulate Joe Thomas? I mean, Lane Johnson has done it and he became an all pro player. Right. And he's got elite talent, but he copied the stance. He copied, you know, the footwork and, you know, it's paying off for Lane. Uh, other guys should study it. You know, yeah, yeah. they should, you know, one thing about Joe is he's an open book. I mean, you want to call Joe up and talk football with him. You pretty much have his attention. To right. Talk football. So, you know, but why wouldn't, you know, somebody want to emulate Jerry Rice? 
you know. And, you know, I, mean, I, I remember one day I was doing a 49er game and I was out of practice on a Friday, and Jerry Rice, when he wasn't on the field with the offense, had somebody throw him a football the entire time that he wasn't catching a football. And then when the person that was throwing the football was, he's usually a trainer or somebody, was busy doing his real job, Jerry was throwing the football to himself. <laughs> you know, you know, so he never stopped catching a football the whole day. Yeah. So wh why wouldn't you want to be like Jerry Rice? You know, but <laughs> some guys just don't understand that commitment or don't right. want to put that commitment in there. Now, do you think do you think that's something that you know you could take Joe's technique and, and do it as a guard, or or do you think that that's a different play? Well, there, there are certain things you could do as a guard, but you would never want to just get ver that vertical. Okay. Like in your set. Right. You know, like if you want to study a guard, you should study, you know, study Quentin Nelson okay. in Indianapolis right now, who came out of Notre Dame and, you know, he's been the first team all pro left guard for two years in a row. And he's the epitome of what it takes to be the best in the business. And that's what he wants to be. I mean, I know Quentin Nelson now. He's a Jersey kid. I've gotten to know him. Uh, I've studied all his games. He wants to be the best guard to ever play the game. So uh, he was the sixth pick of the draft by the Colts and he changed the culture of the whole team. Right. Um, the way the tenacity, um, you know, he's six foot five, he's 335 pounds. Um, but he plays with a low center of gravity. He keeps his knees bent. He's got incredible power. Okay. Uh, he's got great hands. Um, he can almost do a split. Um, he's got tremendous flexibility, which is important to be able to open your hips and to open and run. Um, when he was uh, 10 years old, he, he begged his mom and dad to play football, but he was, he was too big, too heavy to play football in, in the weight class. So he started running to keep his weight down and he ran cross country and he could run three miles when he was 10 years old and he kept his weight down. But even now he has incredible endurance because of that ability to run. Um, he still can, like he can run all day. He never gets tired. Right. right. Um, he can dunk a basketball with two hands at 340 pounds. He has explosion, but he works on his explosive lifts. Um, his, his leg drive is incredibly persistent. So it doesn't matter who he's going up against. He can drive them off the wall. His feet don't stop in the run game. Um, uh, his finish, like once he gets on you and he gets you going in one direction, he will just continue to finish and keep his feet moving until he takes you over the file. Um, there's really, he really doesn't have any peers in the NFL right now at guard. Like he's so the best. What would you say then would be between it, just from like that guard to tackle position that, that what would be like the key differences between the two positions that are, or even, you know, center and guard when, when well, he wants to do like Joe's going to give up space to have a, a meeting point in okay. the passing game with you. All right. Quentin's not going to give up any space. He's okay. going to try and beat you right at the line of scrimmage. Because quarterbacks, a lot of quarterbacks can defeat uh, rushes coming off the edge, the Miles Garrett's of the world, the Von Miller's of the world. They know how to defeat that by stepping up. But if they can't step up because there's push in their face, that's what gives Drew Brees and Tom Brady and a lot of these quarterbacks the most problem. So what Quentin's trying to do is keep that guy right in the line of scrimmage. Okay. And try to win and beat you right away with his punch, his hands, his his ability to anchor, just, you know, drop his center of gravity so that you can't push him backwards. And that's what makes someone like Aaron Donald so dangerous inside is that you you, you take the speed of a Dwight Freeney and, the, I mean, really the size of a Dwight Freeney, yeah. and then you move him inside with that speed and compared to, you know, Vince Wilferk's an amazing it was amazing yeah. to tackle, but compared to him, his first step is going to be that much quicker. So it, it almost creates more trouble for a guard or a center and and a quarterback to try and pick up that speed than than if it if he was out on the outside. Really? Yeah, I mean the great pass rushers never go through you, Dane. They they either go around you or they take a side, they take a shoulder because you're you you're you're weakest on the edge, right? Right. So. Right. Like, they're going to get to your edge however they can. Now, there are certain guys that have incredible power that have the ability to just, as a changeup, go right through you, and they get your hands inside with leverage, and they can back you up. But the great ones get to your edge. 
And so Aaron Donald is always looking to get to your edge. All right. He has the power to come, come through you, but it's just one of the ways that he's going to beat you. And so if you are a left guard going up against Aaron Donald, and he's on your outside shoulder. Okay. And, and you step, say, with your left foot to go like, like an aiming point would be like inside of his crotch. If you, if you took his crotch and you took his foot and you put it right in, in the middle of it, that'd be a good aiming point. But if you overstep that, okay, uh-huh. or you don't step far enough, and he's, he's a moving target, so you're hitting a moving target, like as soon as your footwork is bad, he's going to make you pay. Right, right. Yeah, if you overstep, if you don't step with power, uh, he's going to see it. Or if you overstep and he comes inside, like he's so fast that you don't have the ability to to make that up and to counter that. And so that's, you know, it's part of his game. So do you think over time now, just like watching him play the last few years, it's like, do you think the interior line and, and, and – that on defense, do you think the interior linemen are going to slowly change, like size wise, where they're going to be more Aaron Donalds inside than 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 you know typically there would be? Whereas you know back you know you think about like Fletcher Cox would be a little bit bigger of a guy. Are those bigger guys going to start to sort of like fall off, or are we going to see teams where they have one monster dude and and one Aaron Donald? I guess. Good question. Um, I think Aaron Donald is is just the ultimate outlier. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know there there are guys that play like um, um, I'm trying to uh, I'm forgetting his name right now. Uh, Ninety seven for Cincinnati. I'm, I'm just blanking right now. But there's there, there are certain guys that can play the game. Um, at six foot tall inside um, and be effective. But the majority of them, you know, the Keem Hicks, Fletcher Coxes, you know, those guys, they, they, they're, they're going to dominate the defensive tackle position. Now, if you don't have the ability to rush the passer and push the pocket because you get winded too quickly, right. you can't move your weight well enough, then you're going to be a dinosaur in this league. And there's going to be a place for you, but it's not going to be at a big payday. There's going to be, you know, 15 or 20 plays that you could be. So, for example, this kid got hurt this year, but he's an incredible player. Vita Vea, yeah, yeah. you know, with the Tempe Buccaneers is the definition of Polynesian power, right? He's, he's six foot three, he's, he's 350 pounds, and he has just incredible power that he can back anybody up. Now, he, he tore his ACL this year, so he's out for the year. But, you know, he, he, he could push a pocket. And he could run, and he could flatten, you know. And he was had the, you know, the size to just eat up double teams. He's an outlier because he he had good pass rush, and he didn't want to take him off the field. He could play. And Dominican Sue is a guy that, you know, is 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 a guy that people stop talking about because they just, you know, he doesn't get sack numbers right now like he used to. But you know, he's never missed a game. Right. He's never missed a start in ten years. He started every game. He got suspended for two games. It's the only games he's ever missed. But he started 10 straight years, and he plays a high volume of plays. He plays probably 70 75% of the snaps. And he's incredibly gifted. He's incredibly strong, and he takes incredible care of himself. And, you know, there's a lot of people that want to dismiss and Dominican Sue, but he's playing on a defense right now that's the best in the league against the run. Um, he, was, he was next to Aaron Donald for a couple of years there with the Rams. He went all the way to the Super Bowl. Um, he, he's a great player. Like he got, uh, you know, he got a, a moniker of being a dirty player early on when he was with Detroit. And, you know, maybe that was valid. I don't know. But, you know, he made some dirty plays. But, you know, he's, he doesn't play like that anymore. But he's, he's a really valuable player on a great defense right now. So would you say the difference between, you know, somebody like Sue, like, or somebody, let's just say the classic, that classic, like, Domicon Sue in, in the interior – Versus the Miles Garrett, that difference is going to be the guy coming out off the outside. He's going to be more speed based. He still might be a freak athlete, strong as hell, but he's going to be much more speed based. Whereas you know Sue is going to be just stupid strong and a, and a lot bigger, obviously, because he's got to get more of a push from that interior side. Whereas the guys on the yeah. outside, they know they're getting that space given to them by that by the left tackle. There, there's different, there's just different body types because okay. they're being asked to do different things. Right. Okay. You know, and so, you know, the, 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 
Miles Garrett is an incredibly like he's the number one pick in the draft. I mean, for a reason now. And even the year they came out of Texas A&M, he had a high ankle sprain for almost the entire year. And so he, he wasn't the same guy as last year at Texas A&M as he was the year before. But, you know, when, when you tested him and you saw a guy 6'5 and 280 pounds, 285 pounds, and then, you know, the way that he could run, his the way that he generates power, and the way that he can bend and just, you know, convert speed to power on right. a consistent basis he is – and and how low he can play, there's he's he's just a you know I'm gonna see him this weekend. I'm I'm doing the Raiders and, and Browns game in Cleveland this week. So and, and I and I've stood next to him. I've talked to to Miles since he was in college. Like he wants he he wants to be great. And, and people question, does he want to be Bruce Smith great? Does he just want to be a good player? I mean, I think he wants to be great. And he, he you better have a game plan for you know number ninety five every play. But that, um, that also, what you just said there, does he want to be Bruce Smith great? Well, you had mentioned earlier he's, he, uh, he's training with Bruce Smith, so he does want to be – he wants to learn yeah, from the great Yeah, team. I mean, he's, you know, he's reached out, and Bruce is open to it. And In fact, I was in Cleveland last year for a game, um, and, you know, the, the game ended and whatever. And I, I'm, you know, I'm at the airport. I'm getting on a plane. I'm getting on a plane, and Bruce Smith is sitting next to me. And so, <laughs> like, he's going down to – you know, he lives in Virginia. He's going out of Virginia – I'm going to Philadelphia. We're all going to Philadelphia. I, he, he was there in Cleveland watching, you know, Miles Garrett play. Right, we, right. we talked Miles Garrett, you know, for the flight from Cleveland to Philadelphia. But, yeah, he wants to be great. So he's, he's working with the best ever. And, and really, um, that's the old Tony Robbins trick, you know. If you want to be the best at something, right, go mirror the best. If you want to be the best heart surgeon in the world, go spend a week with the best heart surgeon. Right. You learned all of their – not tricks. Uh, tricks would be the wrong word for a doctor – but learn all of his skills that you can absorb them. You want to be a great trader on Wall Street, go go train with the best trader. Right. You know, and so if you want to be the best defensive end, go train with the best that ever did it. You know, and so that, that's smart. I mean, why wouldn't you do that? You know, you mentioned Joe Thomas. Why wouldn't you want to be Joe Thomas? Well, go pick Joe Thomas's brain. You know, like he's he's not he's not like literally um, you know, sitting um, I don't know, in some ivory tower where he's yeah, like ignoring people. Yeah, like he's not, he, that's not, that's not Joe at all. You want to learn from the best, go, go train and go talk to the best. Well, and that's, that's, I mean, that takes us back to your ball, you know, ball these breakdowns. It's like I sit there and, and because I am in very technical sports, now there is that, that technical breakdown of almost each specific battle on the line that, usually gets you know, overseen because we're always just watching the skilled guys. And now right. it's like, oh, every single position has a huge battle going on. And, and it, you know, it's, it's incredible the, the, you know, when you actually start to break it down, what goes into – and even, you know, in the, the interview you did with Joe, I wanted to ask you this, is like, are these guys every play just keying on the mic or are they keying on the mic and then they're looking at the safeties, what's going on, and then they're going to read and say, what's the tendency now of this, the D line? See, the next level, once these guys master the techniques, and you never really master them. You, you know, it's, it's, it's like the martial artist, right? It's an art. You just train the art. You, you rep the art. You, right. you rep – I mean, it, but you, it, you never you never reach it, right? You All you do is just keep trying to perfect it, you know. And so, uh, it, it, in say a guy like Joe Thomas, okay, once you get to, to a mastery level, right, the next step is to really understand what defenses are trying to do. And so now your eyes go from blocking Terrell Suggs, right, Terrell Suggs, you go from blocking him to now seeing – What's the secondary doing? Yeah. Where's the blitz coming? Is there a blitz coming? What's their tendency on third and three versus third and 12? And so then once you start to see your job within the framework of what a defense is trying to do to you, then you really can take your game to the next level because then you can anticipate um, some of the things that might happen on your side. If, if, you, if you have a pretty good expectation that there's going to be a blitz off the edge, there's a pretty good tendency, probably 99% tendency, that your man's going inside. Right, right. But so now, right. once you know he's going inside, you can anticipate that and stop the inside move. Right. You know, and then you might be able to reach out and help out, you know, on the All outside. The blitz. So that's where a lot of guys never learn and take their game to where 
they can really understand the concept of the defense and what your player or what your responsibility is in relation to what they're trying to do. Right. And right. the great ones always get to that spot. In fact, you know, I, there's days on Sundays when I played, and, it, and today it's just no difference, when certain players are just – they're calling out the play. Yeah. They're already yeah. calling it out. And you're like, how the hell are we going to beat this? They already know what to play. <laughs> but, you know, if you – you know, the great players are Derek Brooks in Tampa Bay. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'll never forget – like, not only did he have notebooks on every single team and every single game, he took the notebooks out to practice and would write things in the notebook during practice that he would go back and study. Like, they're in a vault somewhere. His notebooks are in a vault. You know, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a great show to do it. But, you know, the great ones, they just – they never stop studying the game. But to the point where I was saying – Derek Brooks' thing is, if you knew the formation, you knew the play. Formation, play, formation, play. So no matter how many times you shift in motion before, at, at some point, you're going you're, you're gonna to snap the ball, and they're going to be in a certain formation. And from that formation, What's the you're going to have a high tendency to know what the play is. And now all you're trying to do is give yourself that advantage. And that's really what this whole thing is about is all this studying and repetition, you know, like give yourself the best advantage possible to win that play. Absolutely. Hey, before we get off here, Brian, I wanted to ask you if you could give me like the top, you know, top three, top five best D D lineman, best offensive lineman of all time. And then then we'll end it here. Well, uh, I would say that, I mean, you know, the best defense of all time, was the Pittsburgh Steelers, the, the steel curtain of the 70s. They won four Super Bowls. I mean, I think the Minnesota Vikings in their Super Bowl against Pittsburgh, they had a minus, nine-ish yard, minus nine yards. So, I mean, if you're going to start with defensive linemen, you got to start with Joe Green. You know, I mean, Joe Green, and, then, you know, he played in an era where they weren't really recording sacks. And, you know, I mean, I, I, you, you couldn't create a list of defensive linemen without putting Joe Green on the list. You know, um, I played with Randy White in uh, in Dallas. Yep. Randy White was, um, you know, came out of Maryland. They, they tried to make him a middle linebacker. Uh, it really didn't work out at middle linebacker. But, you know, 260 pounds, 265 pounds, he ran a, under a 4.640. Um, and he worked with martial artists his entire career. I mean, I played with Randy. So he took martial arts and incorporated it where it, it was a hand game. It was a battle of, of hand battles. And he learned how to defeat any battle with hands. And so I, I would say I'd go Joe Green, Randy White, Reggie White, because we've never seen a guy 6'5". When I played with Reggie in Philadelphia, we had a uh, we had an electronic scale, okay? And um, you stepped on the scale and, you know, digital, it was a digital scale. Yeah, yeah. So it digitally would go, you know, 300, 310, and it was on the way into the shower. So Every once in a while, I kind of sneak a peek at Reggie stepping on the scale, and he'd get off it as it was getting past three thirty. So you know it was getting to three thirty-five or maybe maybe three forty. But nobody, you know, at Tennessee, he he practiced with the basketball team and could dunk dunk two basketballs at once. Right. So we're talking about that level of athlete at six five, three hundred thirty-five pounds. He had a hump move that nobody else has ever perfected, where he could take three hundred and thirty, three hundred fifty-pound men and body toss them off the screen. So physically, we, we've never seen anybody like Reggie White. So I, I, I go Joe Green, Randy White, Reggie White. You know, and then I think you got to take Aaron Donald and put him in that category um, right now because he looks like he's on that pace. Uh, you know, he, he, he's, played every, he's played every game. He doesn't miss games. He, he plays a high volume of snaps, and he's dominating these games now for the last six years. So I put Aaron Donald there. And there was a stretch of four years from 2012 to 2015 that J.J. Watt okay. was as good as anybody ever. Um, you know, his sacks, plays, plays by the line of scrimmage, splash plays. I mean, that four-year stretch was as good as anybody that's ever played the game. How about on the offensive line then? Well, there's hmm. – <laughs> Jackie Slater played 20 years. 20 years at right tackle. I that's mean, he's, he's – yeah. And so, you know, Jack used to joke. Um, he'd find reasons to kind of 
miss training camp or sit out of training camp, but he'd say <laughs> for every training camp that he missed. And this is back when every team went through two days every day, yeah, yeah. three-hour practice in the morning and afternoon. He said every training camp I missed gave me two more years to my career. So he, he held out a couple of training camps. But you played 20 years, you know, for the Rams like you did. I, I don't know that you can leave Jackie Slater, you know, off of that, you know, off of that. I think you have to go Anthony Munoz because Anthony Munoz was a, you know, he was a five-star pitcher for USC, won a national championship as a left-handed pitcher for USC, and yet um, was the benchmark for left tackles in Cincinnati. Um, just his longevity, the level of play, um, athleticism, uh, the whole thing. I mean, you got you got to go Anthony Munoz. I would go Walter Jones. Uh, Walter Jones out of Seattle was the first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, you could build in, in like he 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 could literally. I mean, he's from like this little small town, Alabama. He he, he pushed trucks, you know, for fun to build up his strength and power. Right, and that, right. That's what he did on Sunday. I mean, anybody in front of him, he could just move him out of the way. So I'd go Walter Jones. Uh, I would go Jonathan Ogden. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Ogden uh, had unbelievable balance. You know, even at 300, they had a, you talk about scales, they had a meat locker scale in Baltimore. I, I did their preseason games for a number of years. And um, they had nine players. This was a real source of, um, uh, not uh, of, of, of pride for the Ravens. Yeah. They had nine players during a stretch of time that, all weighed over 350 pounds. The scale went up to 350 pounds. It stopped at 350. So Tony Siragusa, you know, Tony Adams, like, um, you know, Adams, Siragusa, Jonathan Ogden, Wally Williams, um, uh, uh, Zeus, I mean, all these guys, they all weighed over 350. But Jonathan Ogden was 6'9", over 350 pounds. He could surf. I mean, he went to UCLA. He learned how to surf at 350 pounds. He's a I mean, shot putter as well. Shot putter. I mean, uh, unbelievable athlete. But just a level of consistency, um, he was, if you think about it, you know, in the 1996 draft, they drafted Jonathan Ogden with the second pick and the 24th pick they took Ray Lewis. They took two first ballot Hall of Famers. Yeah, that's crazy. Same draft. So, but I, I'd say, you know, you, you'd go that group right there, you know, and you'd put Jonathan Ogden in that group. All and then right, you would I... take, and, and then at center, you would take Dwight Stevenson, even in seven years. Okay. Nobody ever played the the position of center like Dwight Stevenson played the, the position of center. So I, I put those five guys there. That's awesome. All right, Brian, thanks a lot for doing this, and uh, hopefully we'll meet up in the future and discuss some some more trench warfare. Let's do it, Dane. Let's do it. Let's uh, let let me see some of your training methods here and some of the guys that you're doing it with, and uh, I can always put some video together to kind of show you like on a call like this. Um, some, you know, some live and some baldy breakdowns that awesome. we could do if you wanted to teach it to other players or whatever. Okay. We could, we could put some techniques and fundamentals and how training and techniques and fundamentals, you know, carry to the, to the game field. Yeah. And almost like getting that together. I would love that. That'd be yeah. awesome. Okay. Great right. thing. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah. My pleasure, man. A lot of fun.